Thank you for joining us for another power-packed message from Dr. Miles Monroe, provided by Monroe Global Incorporated and MonroeGlobal.com. We transform followers into leaders and leaders into agents of change. We hope that this message is a blessing to you as you advance your life and discover your purpose. Now, let's go into the message. Please write this down. The four types of law. The four types of law. And this is, this is the spirit that Jesus brought to earth. The four types of law. Am I on? I am on. I am on. I think my wife told me to be on. All right, I'm on. Praise God. Understanding what? What did I say? Please write that down. I'm checking. Understanding what? Success is predictable and so is failure. And all nations succeed or fail based on how they deal with law. Because the foundation of all nations is law. And as we celebrate in the United States for a few days ago, independence, America is over 250 years old, and yet America is struggling. So age doesn't make you wiser or better. We are a young nation, 37 years old, and I hope we listen to the word of God today as individuals and as a corporate community. Secondly, remember this, that nations are built on law and they are sustained by law. This is very important. Nations are not built on culture. Even though many countries focus on culture, they forget that culture is a product of law. So a nation is only as successful and the quality of those people in that country are only as successful as their submission to law. Every problem in our nations is a result of the violation of law. All problems. Why? Because all societies must adhere to law if they are going to keep order in the country. And we are suffering from disorder in all of our nations. The solution to national decay is not difficult, but it's not easy. The solution is a return to law. Therefore, if we're going to build a strong community, we got to believe and understand that community is created by law. Our country is only as strong and adhesive as the people's willingness to keep the law. Now, there are a number of things that law does for a country, and I want you to write them down. All nations are built on law because nations depend on law to keep national order. Have you noticed that whenever there's disorder in the country, you always put your attention on the law enforcement people, the police, the defense force, and the courts. If you notice that whenever there is an increase in crime or increase in homicides, everyone talks to the law enforcement areas. We look to the Minister of National Security, we look to the police commissioner, and we look to the Supreme Court judges. Why? Because all three of them are called law enforcement agencies. Whenever there's disorder, you gotta deal with law. 
because law does a few things. Number one, law guarantees national security, national safety, national prosperity, national development. It guarantees national pride and national wealth. Law also guarantees national culture. If you look at that list, you can see that law really guarantees the nation. So whenever you decide to not understand law, submit to law, and obey law, you become a national security risk. And this is why when we talk about living in the kingdom of God, we must understand that the kingdom of God is not a religion. The kingdom of God is a country. And the purpose of God was to establish his kingdom on earth so that earth can become a colony of heaven. And therefore, the kingdom of God is a country. It is not a religion. A kingdom is a nation. Now, the kingdom of God is a supernatural country. It is the first country in existence. It's invisible, but it's more real than earth. Therefore, if the kingdom of God is a kingdom, then it must be built on law. Now, that is why this point number four is so important. The key to living in the kingdom of God is, like in any other country, you have to submit to its laws. We are obligated to obey the law if we are a citizen of a country because laws are the keys to a successful citizen living in a nation. Do you know that if all the people in the country keep the law, then nobody will be robbed. Nobody will be killed. There'll be no abuse of children or destruction of property or removal of people's property. Therefore, there'll be less financial need to finance guns for the police and police patrol cars and investing in more jails. In other words, when people keep the law, the country prospers. Do you know that most of the budget of our nation now is going to law enforcement? Because when people don't keep the law, taxes go up. The same thing has to be remembered when we enter the kingdom of God. The kingdom of God is only as effective as our capacity to obey the law of God. Matthew 16 Verse 19, Jesus talks about the laws. He says, I will give you the keys of the kingdom of heaven. Whatever you allow on earth or whatever you bind or disallow on earth, heaven will disallow. In other words, when you come into the kingdom of God, if you obey its laws, whatever you demand on earth, heaven will support. Whatever you stop on earth, heaven will stop it. Heaven gives you laws that affect life on earth. Therefore, the keys are representing the law. God's desire, therefore, is to bring the kingdom of God on earth so that he can have the laws of God on earth. And what do laws do? They produce a culture. Jesus said, when you pray, pray like this. Our Father who is in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come to earth. Thy will be done on earth just like it is in heaven. Now, if heaven is a nation of laws, then earth must become a planet of laws so that God can have his will done on earth. God's goal, therefore, is to fill earth with the culture of heaven. Write this down. Culture is a product of law. Culture is a product of law. This is such an important truth. Whenever a government makes a law, it's creating a new culture. For example, if the law of a country allows people to gamble, that it becomes law, then you'll find that your five-year-old child will develop a culture of chance. And in five or six years, the whole country will become a country of luck. And in 20 years, people will have issues with a work ethic. In other words, a culture will develop where people will spend 
more of their resources on chance than on investment. It begins with just one law. When the United States passed the law for legalized abortion in states that would allow it, it created a culture of legal killing. Do you know that over 500,000 babies are killed every year in the United States? The Bahamas is only 300,000 people. So they actually kill more of people than our country every year in the womb. Why? Because of a law. Now when you give a law to destroy babies, and babies are humans, then you'll find that the value placed on human falls. Because the culture of death becomes legal. So it's easier to destroy people by homicide and by murder if law allows murder legally. In other words, the country becomes confused. If a person is only six weeks old, they can be killed. But if they are six years old, they can't be killed. So you're confused. Are they not the same person? The law says if they are a certain age, they're not a human. When does a human become a human? It's been the issue of the whole discussion. In other words, laws can produce a culture that can create an entire generation of people who have reduced the value of human life, the power of law. Law is inherent regulations and principles that control and regulate nature. God created laws that govern relationships. God created laws that govern the spiritual world, the natural world, and the physical world. And these laws are built into creation by God. Now, humans make laws, and God's concern is all human law should be based on natural and divine law. When a human law contradicts natural law or spiritual law, then a new culture emerges that is destructive. God says there's a way that seemed right unto a man, but the end thereof is the way of death. God didn't create you to live without law. Write this point down, please. Human relationships are built on law. How you relate to your parents is supposed to be a law. The Bible says this is a law. Obey your mother, uh, your parents rather, and only your father and mother. That's a law in the Ten Commandments. Why did God make it a law? Because it's good for society. If the young respect the old, you'll have a society of order. But God's laws protect relationships. Thirdly, social relationships are products of law, and therefore law is the key to prosperity in the country. I was thinking the other day, I was reading an article. It says that children brought up in a home with one parent have less of a chance of success in, in education, higher education than those who were not. Now, that's not true in all cases, but they say that the majority of their study shows that when there's a breakdown in the family, it affects the future of a child. So when God says to love your wife and respect your husband, he's protecting the next generation. So re the respect for law guarantees prosperity for the country. That's why when Jesus came, he came to earth to restore the law of God. We lost the order of God. Because when you have law, you have order. Many people say when Christ came, he came to bring grace. And therefore, he came to cancel law. Of course, that's not true. Because law is kept not to obtain salvation and grace. It's kept because you are saved. In other words, salvation and grace was given to keep the law. God doesn't want you to obey the law so you can get saved. He saved you so you could obey the law. Is that clear? In other words, we are not saved or redeemed by the law, but we are saved and redeemed to keep the law. This is why in the church there's so much immorality, 
lack of values and deterioration in people's relationships because even in the church there is this lack lack of respect for law and order this is why many Christian people love grace because they use grace to violate law you've heard people say well I'm gonna do it I feel like doing it and when I finish doing it I'm gonna ask God to forgive me why because God loves me so they go ahead and they do what they have to do it's against the law of God and then they run to God and say forgive me give me some grace what they're doing is they're using grace as license to break the law write this down grace without law is forgiveness without discipline we want to be forgiven we don't want to be disciplined you cannot live in a country without discipline you cannot be a citizen without discipline every citizen in our nation who breaks the law if they are proven to have broken the law we remove them from society where do we put them in prison why because they are not disciplined enough to live in society this is the same thing about the law of God God did not bring his grace to earth to cancel law he came to earth to make sure that we keep the law and just in case you don't believe me in Matthew chapter 5 our foundation scripture for the year and you'll see it on our banner at the bottom Matthew chapter 5 verse 17 the first statement about Jesus concerning law he said do not think I have come to destroy the law or abolish the law or the prophets who spoke them do not think I came to destroy why did he say that because he knows that we would develop a theology which would cancel law and most of our Protestant denominations and groups have come to the to the level where grace has taken over their lives to the point where they don't need law anymore the words of Jesus again Matthew chapter 5 he says do not think I have come to destroy the law because I know you're gonna think so and then he went a step further he says I have not come to abolish the law but to fulfill it I came to make sure that you can keep it and then he went one step further he says if any of you teach others to disobey the law you are least in the kingdom of heaven but if you obey the law and practice it and teach other people to practice it he says you'll be great in the kingdom of God in other words not one jot or tittle in the law will be canceled because of my grace on the cross it is not a substitute for law grace does not replace law grace takes you back and gives you the responsibility to keep the law again you know look at this verse again everybody read it together out loud Matthew 5 19 read anyone who breaks one of the least of these commandments and teaches others the same will be called least in the kingdom of heaven read but whoever practices and teaches these commandments and laws will be called great in the kingdom of heaven stop right there read that again whoever what practices okay but I thought you was under grace I'm not under law I'm under grace he says look whoever practices the laws will be called what great and whoever teaches others to keep the laws will be great I am so saddened to see what's happening in the church the church is so lawless we got pastors living like hoodlums and mafia and harlots and still preaching say amen man I'm living here by myself in other words it seems as if anything goes and you're still saved we need to listen to the words of Jesus he said if anyone practices and teaches others to keep these laws 
they shall be called what? Great in the kingdom of God. This verse will be repeated all year because we need to remember he said, do not think I came to destroy the law. And then he says, your righteousness must what? Surpass that of the religious leaders. What he does here is he cancels ritual law and reestablishes divine law. The Pharisees and scribes were so busy keeping ritual laws, which is one of the laws, but ritual law is not what God sent Christ to restore. Matter of fact, Jesus came to cancel ritual law and to reinstate divine and natural law. Because he created both the divine world and the natural world. Ritual law is always temporary, but natural and divine laws are permanent. He said, I came to fulfill. The word fulfill means these words. Write it down. It means to enforce. It means to explain or restore. It means to put the spirit back into the law. To fulfill means he came to demonstrate how it's supposed to be practiced. In other words, he brought back to earth what the law meant. He didn't cancel it. Therefore, we are obligated to live according to the laws of God. And God gave us the Holy Spirit, the governor, to give us the power to do what the law says. Someone said to me, well, you know, I can't keep the laws of God. Listen, I remember a woman who Jesus met who was caught in adultery. And he said to her, before Calvary, go and sin no more. That was before Calvary. She didn't have the Holy Ghost. And yet he said, go and sin no more. Was he lying to her? Was he telling her that she cannot do it? Which means somewhere in your conscience is the ability and the will to do right. You don't need the Holy Ghost to help you do right. Oh Lord, I'm in trouble now. See, some of y'all, you, matter of fact, y'all, y'all, not you, the one behind you, you all take the Holy Ghost into your sin with you. You hear the Holy Ghost saying, don't do this. Please don't do this. I'll be right back. And you go and you sin, and then you come back and say, now please forgive my Holy Ghost. In other words, you, you sin with the Holy Ghost in your body. Because keeping the law is a matter of your will and your conscience. This is why we need to line up. Now, let me tell you why it's so important to understand this. Because law represents a number of things. Write this list down. This is new here. Law is, first of all, regulation. It's also known as decree. It's a statue. Everybody says statue. When you read the Bible, all through the Bible it says, keep my statues. Keep my statues. What is a statue? A statue is something that doesn't change. When you go downtown in the Bahamas, you'll see a lady sitting in a chair right in the middle of the, of the square. What's her name? Victoria. She been there before I was born, and she can be there when I leave. She's like the law. Never change. When it's hot, she's smiling. When it's cold, she's smiling. When it's raining, she just sits there and smiles. When you curse at her, she smiles. When there's a hurricane, she sits in the middle of it. In other words, laws don't change for nobody. Christ says the law is a statue. Laws also mean a canon or that which is set. It's a tenant. It means a ruling that rules your life. You know, when you hear them talk in the, in the courtroom about this is a ruling, what they're saying is this statement rules your life. It is a ruling that you will stay away 50 yards from that person from now on. Do not go within 50 yards of that woman. Now, the, the judge said that's a ruling. Rule means what? Rulership. That statement rules your life. Law is something that rules you. So a law also is a rule. It becomes the king of your life. Law also means commandments. A commandment is a law that is repeated. When I give a law, it's called an instruction. When you repeat it, it is called a command. Do you see it? So God gave Moses what? Instructions, 10 instructions. When he went down to the mountain, he gave them the commandments of the Lord. He repeated them. My job is to give you the commandments of the Lord. 
Why? He already gave the instructions in his document here, in his constitution. My job is to repeat those laws, which means I give you the commandments of the Lord. That's why Christ says, if you love me, you will keep my commandments. That means when I say something, do not fornicate, do not commit adultery, do not bear false witness. He says, I'm giving you the command. It becomes the ruler of your life. You're supposed to live under that rule. It becomes an act or an edict. In other words, a formula you can depend on. Now, let me tell you something about the formula part. A law becomes a formula. Everybody say formula. Oh, please get this one. Now, when does a law become a formula? Every law has a condition. It also has built into it a consequence. All laws have conditions and consequences. That's what makes it a formula. For example... The law of a seed is it must have water and nutrients, which is in the soil. So I have a seed, and I want a tree with fruit. That's what I want. That is the promise of the seed. Every law God gives has attached to it a promise, but it also has a consequence. Now, if I want that seed to bring forth the tree with fruit, what do I have to do? submit that seed to the laws of seed. I got to put it in the ground and give it some water. Now, do I have to pray for the tree to come up? Are you sure? No, I don't have to pray. Why? Write this down. Laws make success automatic. That makes it a formula. A formula is when you can predict the outcome of something. That's why it's called a formula. Now, most of us are struggling with the formulas of God. For example, God says, give, and it shall be given unto you. That's a law, but it's also a formula. Give, and it shall be given unto you. I remember when my mother was alive. My father, hi, Dad. My father's here. Stand up, Dad. My dad is 86 years old in May, just gone. Give him a big hand. That's how you look at 86. I love you, my daddy. I love you so much. You're the best daddy in the world. My father and mother taught us something. My mother used to say all the time. She says she would take the bread from our table and give it to the poor people in the neighborhood. And we would just get like a piece of it. And we used to wonder why she kept giving it. She said, because your, your father's salary is not enough to take care of 11 children. So I can't depend on that. I have to give into God's economy, she says. So she would bake 10 cakes and only one was for us. And she would give them to all these poor people in the neighborhood. And then she would say this. She said, do you remember the scriptures, boy? It says, cast your bread on the water, and not many days afterwards, it shall come back. And she kept saying that. And then one day she told me, she says, son, it, some of y'all waiting for your ship to come in. She said, you can't wait for your ship to come in if you ain't sent none out. She was dealing with what? A formula. She understood the formula. If you put it in, certain things come out. If you put it in, certain things come out. That's when a law becomes a formula. God says, well, watch God. God says to Israel, God says, you are poor, you are naked, you are, are, are begging, you are corrupt, your whole society is falling apart, nothing is working. Sounds familiar, eh? And then the people says, why is this happening to us? God says, because you break the formula. What formula? You robbed me. They say, how we rob you? He says, I gave you all a formula. I gave you a law, and I predict what would happen if you break the law. They said, what have we done? He said, you did not pay your tithes and your offerings. And now watch him now. He's going to quote the formula. He said, he says, if you bring the tithe, there's a condition, into the storehouse, that's the law, see if I would not open the windows of heaven, that's the formula, and out of that will come a blessing you ain't got room to contain. That's the consequences. That's the promise. Now watch the other side of it. He says, but if you do not bring the tithe into the storehouse, that's disobedience, he says, the devourer will come and eat up all your crops. That's the consequence. A law has that kind of power. By the way, I'm getting ahead of myself here, but laws 
free the judge from personal responsibility. Are you all listening to me? This is very important what I'm saying. Write that down. The law does what? Frees the judge from personal responsibility. That's why judges are protected. The judge simply says, look, the law said this, and the law said if you do this, the law said this will happen. This, this ain't personal for me. My job is to simply tell you what the law says would happen if you do this. God doesn't judge you. God said, do you know why you're poor, Israel? Because you robbed me by not obeying the law of tithes and offerings. In other words, I didn't make you poor. Poverty is built in to stinginess. Am I coming through? <laughs> There's a law of heat and fire, right? Eh? Yeah. You put your hand in fire, you don't need God to burn you. There's a law built in, which means that everything that you and I are experiencing is a choice. You can decide to turn your life around today by simply deciding, I'm going to change the laws I'm obeying. I'm going to reconnect with God's laws. I'm going to do what God told me. And God says, if you obey me, I will open the windows of heaven. In other words, your action creates a reaction from God, which produces a result in your life. It's a formula. That's why the next word is important. It's a principle. Principle means first. First law. Laws are that which is established first by the manufacturer, and no one can change them. That's why they're called principles. Your car runs on gasoline. You didn't decide that. The company did who made it. Therefore, it's the principles of gasoline that keeps your car running. Prince, prince means first. Principle means first law. Don't trust people who keep adding laws to the manufacturer's product. Hmm? Well, I know God says marriage is between a male and a female, but we can add another law. We have a she male. And so we got this new law. God says, Where did y'all get that from? I never made a creature like that before. Then our answer, we don't need you no more. We can put a penis on a woman and a vagina on a man. We don't need you no more. We can be got surgery now, man. God, leave us alone. So we actually add something God knows nothing about. And when God sees this thing walking down the street, God says, hey, that's, now that's new. I don't know what law governs that, but that don't work. It can't produce nothing, can't reproduce nothing. It can't produce, can't bring nothing. They made that. That's why it can't produce. Laws are principles. Principle means first regulation, first law. Whatever God laid down at first still remains. Are you all with me? It's important to read the Bible because the Bible is the book of first laws. God said it's not good for man to be alone. So God made for him a wombed man. A man with a womb. <laughs> That's why we call him woman. It means wombed man. So the partner of a, of a man is a wombed man. So a man without a womb ain't supposed to be your partner. And if you ain't sure your man checks if you got a womb. Don't worry about the ponytail and the earrings. You got to check for the womb. If he ain't got a womb, he's a brother. You could paint your paint your face up, put on your wigs, put on your lipstick. You could put on even even an odd little bit of pops in your breasts. But you ain't got no womb. I don't care how you walk, how you do. Use a brother because you can't produce no baby and no womb. Use a brother. Settle down, take your wig off, go get married to a woman. Is anybody here? Don't you better clap because I'm looking. Everybody said the law cannot be changed. That's why no legislation in parliament or congress could change your rectum to an entrance. Yes, I said that. 
Can I say it one more time? I don't care how many MPs vote, how many cast their votes in Congress, no legislation can change your rectum to an entrance. It is an eternal exit. It's the first law cannot be changed. Can I hear an amen? That's how powerful law is. So what do we do? We tamper with God's laws. We think we're smarter. So we have debates on what marriage should look like. And we rearrange the formula. You know, we say, but two women can get married. Well, God doesn't look at that. The manufacturer is concerned. You know, it's like, it's, it's, it's like buying a Mercedes and then putting Toyota parts all over the thing. You know, that ain't going to run long. Imagine me marrying a man who dressed like a woman. Every time you go to bed, I got to take but something. What is this? Brother, you use Mercedes, but you got Toyota all over you, patch up. Toyota, you can't run like this. This ain't going to work. And by the way, when you tamper with a manufacturer's product, you can write this down. The warranty is canceled. That means God don't take responsibility for nothing he didn't create. That's your problem. You got to deal with that, and that's going to self-destruct in your presence. Well, I remember one time I, I had an old Impala, and I used to keep that Impala because, you know, I was just, I guess I was school, trying to, you know, get myself together. And I used to crash that Impala, take it to the mechanic every week. Something was wrong with it. It was an old car. And I said, I ain't gonna call him a mechanic name because you know you all might know him. But I took my car to him. I said, Man, something wrong with this carburetor. And uh, he said, Don't worry, I can fix that. And he got a carburetor from a car in the dump. He says, I can bore an extra hole in, I can let it fit. And I can, you know, and he, and he forced this carburetor on my car. You remember carburetors? Yeah. And he forced on my car. And he said, It run it. He gave me back the car. The car ran for two days. When the car finished running, I didn't only have one problem. That's when my car died. Everything in the engine was messed up because it was a foreign part. mercy on us. Tell your neighbor, leave God's laws alone and obey them. All right, let me give you these four laws and then I want to pray for you because we got to get these laws right. Now, this is important to write down because a lot of people listening to this series saying, oh, Dr. Miles saying we should get back under law. You know, we're we supposed to be free from law. Uh, are we under grace? No, listen carefully. Read the whole Bible. Let's clear it up. There are four types of laws. One, number one, ritual law. Ritual law is secondary law. It is always temporary, and it is ritualistic. It incorporates customs and systems. It also incorporates programs. And all of these are required to restore and correct problems. We call them redemptive laws. For example, in the Old Testament, God introduced, well, let me, let me, let me back up. If you go to Genesis chapter 1 and 2, there are no written laws in that chapter. Adam had no laws written anywhere. Why? Because the law of the law was in his mind. He understood how to live. Then Adam was given one command. Everybody say command. The one command God gave him was, Thou shalt not eat from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, for the day you eat of it, the consequence is built in. You will surely die. Get it? Good. Okay. So Adam now is in the garden. We don't know how long Adam lived there. 
Adam could have lived in the garden for 6,000 years. We don't know that. But one day, something happened. A foreign invader came to the garden, influenced his wife, she influenced him, and Adam broke the law. Now, follow me carefully. There was no written law in that garden for however, however long they lived there. But now the law is broken, and we got the consequence called death. What does God do? He has to what? Correct the problem. So what does God do? God immediately goes into a ritual law. The Bible says, and the Lord killed a lamb, a ram, and took the bloody skin and covered them with it. What's God doing? He's creating a ritual law because he got to use it to correct the problem. But notice the words, it's always temporary. That's why every year until Jesus came, they had to kill a lamb once a year to cover the sins of their family. Why? It was a ritual law. But the, and so, so therefore, the lamb, everybody say with me. Okay. The lamb killing began with God. The first lamb that was killed was in the Garden of Eden when God killed that lamb and put that bloody skin over Adam and Eve. Remember what Adam and Eve was using to cover themselves? This is very interesting. They were using the very same thing that got him in trouble. I pause for effect. Do you know that when you sin, you always use sin to cover the sin? See, once you lie, you got to lie to keep the first lie, and then the third lie, you got to cover the first, second, and third lie, and then by the time you get to the fifth lie, you forget what the truth is, and then you start living a lie. Where you been? I've been to see my cousin. That's not true, man. You've been to see your sweetheart. What time you left here? Six o'clock. You left your mother at six o'clock? Yes. I can call your mother. Don't, don't call her. Don't call her. Don't call her. Don't worry. She ain't home. See, now you're lying three times. See? And the, and the lie continues. In other words, whenever you break the law, you got to break another law to cover the law you break. What got Adam and Eve in trouble? A tree. What are they covering themselves with? A tree. So what does God do? God says, look, there's no blood in leaves. You need blood to cleanse your sin. So God says, I'm, 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 I'm going to provide some blood. And the Bible says God killed the lamb and took the leaves off them and covered them with the lamb's bloody skin. They were covered in blood. That's how they were able to live through that period in the garden. And from then, God, watch God now. God says, now your children got to do the same thing. You remember Cain and Abel? Okay. What did, what did Cain bring to God? Fruits and vegetables, and leaves, and plants. No blood. What did Abel bring to God? A lamb, sheep, blood, whose offering was accepted. Abel, whose was rejected. Cain, who got jealous. Cain, who killed who? Cain killed Abel. Why? Because Abel bought blood. In other words, you don't bring what you feel like to God. You bring what God demands. It's a law. Now, ever since Abel bought that lamb, it was blood required since God killed that first animal. Now watch God. So the ritual law was you come before God with blood. Every family for 6,000 years had to bring blood. I mean for 4,000 years rather, had to bring blood. Every year they came to the temple, every family member had to bring a blood. Some of the the kids bought turtle doves, a bird, you know, they had to bring an animal. The, every family parent had to bring an animal, a goat or a sheep, and everybody, it was a bloody temple. And then one day, God says, that's it. No more rituals. I'm going to bring in my divine law. I'm going to go down myself and become a lamb, and I'll provide my own blood. And I will spill my blood once and for all. So the ritual was done away with. It's no longer a law to kill lambs. And now he has the spiritual divine law of God, which says, when John saw Christ, John said, Behold the lamb that takes away the sins of the world. For the Lord himself, John says, had provided himself a lamb. 
Therefore, we need to kill lambs no more. You ought to give God thanks. This, is, this would have been a bloody building if we were still ritual laws. Now, the second kind of law is what? Legislative law. This is a, this is a, a, a law that humans create. Got to watch this one. Legislative acts are passed by governments and they are applied to human relationships. Now, God is not against you creating legislative laws. But your legislative laws should always be built on his law, otherwise they are unrighteous law. So when you talk about, you know, people say this, Dr. Monroe, why is the church getting involved in politics? Why don't they mind their own business? Come on, you politicians, you know what I'm talking about, I'm talking to some of y'all. Why don't these preachers leave us alone let us make these laws. They're supposed to be preaching. We're supposed to be governing. Wait a minute. Wait just a minute. Don't touch that TV. We can't trust none of y'all. None. Because we ain't sure that the laws you create will be on the foundation of his eternal divine law. So he set us to just checkmate you all the time. Just check you to make sure, is that lining up with God's divine law? This idea that more people are for something than against it is very dangerous. That's why democracy is so effective. Because you can have enough people to vote for something that is evil and try to make it good. You've got to have a reference to make a decision. And the word of God and the laws of God are the reference for any decision you make as a country. And this is why we got to make sure, young people listen to your papa, you got to make sure that they never remove from our constitution the preamble. The preamble says this Commonwealth of the islands shall be governed based on the historic Christian faith. What they're saying is this country will make laws based on biblical principles. That's important. Now, there's some folks in our society who want to remove that because they don't want to refer to the Word of God for no laws. Legislation that is not in line with God's Word is illegal. And we must not sit by and watch people create laws that govern our children that are not in keeping with God's laws. And that's not a religious statement. That's a national statement. It's for our own salvation and sanity. If we don't have laws that preserve and protect the integrity of, of, of just, just nature, we are going to destroy ourselves. The third kind of law is natural law. Everybody say natural law. Write this one down. It's original inherent law. You know, it's that rectum thing I talk about. You know, the, the rectum? The rectum is a natural law. Your colon has a garbage disposal. Nature, everybody say natural. It's from the word nature. There are some laws that are in nature. You are naturally a female. You are naturally a male. And God don't miss like this. Oh, no, you weren't. Somebody touched you up and got you confused some years ago, but no, so you're born that way. Natural law. And natural law is a dangerous law. For example, the oil in the Gulf was there for a million years, minding its own business. It never came to the surface. I'm going to say this again. It was there for a million years and God has natural controls built into the earth's crust that keeps oil from messing up our beautiful ocean. It, it's, it's there, you know, but it's, it's hidden, it's protected, preserved. Could you imagine? We never have a natural oil spill anywhere in the Caribbean. What do we do? We take one pipe 
Let me say, we're going to drill this thing. We're going to puncture God's protection. The oil is in a look. I've been under here for 6,000 years. I've been minding my own business, and I can tell you all now, I got plenty of pressure. <laughs> everybody said with me? That's, everybody say nature. Natural. Natural. It's a natural law. Now, here you go with your piece of equipment. Because you built equipment, machines that run on this thing called gasoline, and you need more. Nature says, okay, puncture me at your own risk. Because I am responsible for what happened after you poke hole in me. I don't understand what I'm saying. They violated a natural law. <laughs> I hear people say, let's call a prayer meeting to pray for the oil spill. I'm sitting there going, right. <laughs> nature was behaving itself. We poke a hole in it. And nature says, look, you know, I got a lot of pressure. And this oil is coming out. It was under pressure for six million years, whatever. And you put the hole in the thing, and the pressure starts coming out. Now, you got to deal with the pressure. So what, what we've been dealing with is a good lesson of what we do with our lives. God says, you to a teen, you ain't never had sex. Okay, here's the law. Don't have sex until you're married. Keep that animal asleep. Keep the pressure under. You're laughing. This is what God is saying. In other words, when God said, don't fornicate, he's telling you, don't puncture that pressure. Because once you puncture that, it's over. You've let loose an appetite that will fight you to your grave. That's why God says, do it after you're married so you can let all the oil out. You don't got to be shame. All the oil, come on. Come on out, oil. Am I right or what? Yeah. Let me tell you something. Sex is a sleeping giant. You don't want to wake him up before time. Some of y'all say they meant love, but you know what I'm talking about. You walking around just like this. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. Oh, I got to hang on to this. Because once you break that hole, you puncture that pressure, nature takes its course. And it becomes like drugs. If you ain't never smoked a cigarette, don't smoke the first one. If you ain't never take drugs, don't you take the first hit. Because once you wake up certain cells in your brain, putting them to sleep becomes a problem. You know what I'm talking about, right? And you got to tell people, look, don't touch it, God says. He doesn't explain a lot. He just says, don't do this. Don't do that. That's a law. He's protecting you from an oil spill. Now we got to try everything in the world to cover it up, eh? All kind of machines going on. That don't work. Try another one. That don't work. Another one. So what? Get married, child. Quick. Paul says if a man, a young man is behaving unseemly with his, his, uh, what do you call it? Fiance. Watch God now. God says, this is in the Bible, no? You listening? Okay. <laughs> the Bible said, young people listen to me. Now, the Bible is smart. God said, this is found in 1 Corinthians 7. It says, if you are not married, you have a, a, a girlfriend, a boyfriend, if you all begin to become sexually interested in each other, the Bible says, marry quickly. He said, because you're burning. And once you start burning, you can't put that fire out. That oil spill, you try everything. You know, in Baintown, when a person get, get, get pregnant, the father would get a shotgun. Come, buddy. You can marry my daughter. <laughs> Why? You don't puncture the oil. <laughs> the spill it. You can handle the spill yourself. It's responsibility. It's natural law. And all of life have natural law built in. And if you keep God's laws and learn them, you will always have a good experience. Natural law are built into creation. You can't change it. And the last law is what? 
spiritual laws. Spiritual laws are those that are established by God for divine relationships. You know, on all the laws we have in the Bible that it have to have to do with relationship with God are divine laws. You know, giving, for example, is a divine law. Forgiveness from those who offend you is a divine law. When someone has offended you, the Bible says, forgive them quickly. That's a law. Why? He says, if you don't, then you will have burdens on your own bones. It says, bitterness will create cancer. So the laws of God are divine, and you cannot adjust them, you can't avoid them, you can't pray for them to go away, they ain't going nowhere. They're just like natural law. Those two laws are important. Natural law and divine laws are so intertwined that when you obey one, you end up obeying the other automatically. And so, here's the three things about those laws. Number one, ritual law is what? Temporary. And that's the one that we are free from. We're no longer under ritual law. We are under grace. But we are still under legislative laws, still under creation laws, and we're still under spiritual law. So the law we are free from is ritual law. Ritual laws include all those systems God gave the priests. And, you know, wear this robe and wear this turban and wear this sash and, you know, put these stones on your chest and, you know, put blood on your thumb and one on your ear and a big toe and all this stuff God told me. Oh, you know, Old Testament full of this stuff. We don't do that anymore. Christ took care of that. That's done away with. But not the divine laws. And not the natural laws. And not the legislative laws that God put in the word of God for us to, to follow. And this is why we must teach on law. Hebrews 10 verse 1 says, read. Let's talk about ritual law. Read. The law is only a shadow of good things that are coming, not the realities themselves. For this reason, it can never, by the same sacrifices repeated endlessly year after year, make perfect those who draw near to worship God. See that? All those were shadows. But when the real lamb came, we don't need to follow ritual laws anymore, it seems. That's the difference. But here's another verse I want you to take home with you. Read. It says this in the book. I want to read this verse here. Galatians, read. Is the law therefore opposed to the promises of God? Absolutely not. Paul is writing. Paul is writing this. Paul says, read. For if a law had been given that could impart life, then righteousness would certainly come by the law. But the scriptures declare that the whole world is what? Prisoner of sin. That's the problem. So that what was promised being given through faith in Christ Jesus might be given to those who believe. In other words, sin came by breaking the law. Grace came so that you can be restored again, so you can keep the law. Look at verse 30, 23. Read. Before this faith came, we had held, been held prisoners by the law. Why? The law locked us up. What do you think put people in jail? You break the law, the law lock you up. We break God's law, it locked us up, away from God's promises. But Paul says what? He says, it locked us up until faith came and was revealed. The faith is, we believe in the work that Jesus did. That's faith. Grace. Look at verse 24. So the law was put in charge to lead us to Christ. In other words, we put you in jail so you can be rehabilitated. Amen. Why do people go to jail? For the hope of rehab. Now, what is, what is rehabilitation? Okay, okay. I can't believe you all missed that one. Okay. What did you do to go to jail? You break the law. So the jail is to what? Correct you. That's why it's called a correction of institution. What is it correcting you to do? Ah, oh, you got it. The law locks you up until you learn to keep the law. <laughs> it doesn't cancel the law. Paul says the law locked us up until faith came so that it could reveal to us that the law was put in charge to lead us back to Christ. 
And Christ is what? The lawgiver. So you, listen, no matter what you've done, God has forgiven you. But he forgave you so you don't do it again. He don't want you to use the forgiveness to keep coming to the altar every weekend after you finish messing up. He gave you forgiveness so that you could keep his laws and don't come back to prison no more. He says, clear. It says, so that we might be justified by faith. Now that faith has come, we are no longer under what? The supervision of ritual law. We don't need to be walking around with lambs and goats and all that stuff anymore. We have been set free, forgiven from all the rituals, but we still have to keep the law. The laws that are divine and the laws that are eternal. So, God is a God of law. His divine laws are inherent, never change. The laws are never canceled. You learn to keep them again. God's divine laws are eternal. God's divine laws are not tradition. God's divine laws are, are given to protect your life. And tradition restricts and controls creativity. But God's divine laws are permanent and they give you prosperity and life. Tradition is always temporary. But divine laws, the Ten Commandments, are forever. Let me ask you a question. Is there a time when you can, when you can eventually stop stealing? Can you, can you outgrow thou shalt not lie? Is thou shalt not lie still, still, still a good law? Yeah. How about covetousness? Is that still a good law? Every Ten Commandment is still a good law. Even keeping the Sabbath, resting one day a week, it's good for your health. So God says, look, I know you ain't going to rest because you want plenty of money and you want to work two jobs and kill yourself. So here's the law. You rest one day. He had to make it a law because he knew that we would not want to rest. And if you don't rest, you make yourself sick and then you blame the devil. God says, look, take a day off every week and recapitulate yourself, recreate yourself, recreation, recreate, and restore your life. I take a Sabbath every week. Why? It's just plain sense. No law of God is a bad law. And the greatest law in the world is this one. If any man break the law, Christ has died on the cross to forgive him, to restore him back to perfect citizenship. And today, that's why we Thank you once again for listening to this message as we hope that it has been a blessing to you. Our goal is to show you new paths and opportunities so that you can discover your purpose. It is your love, support, and partnership that makes Monroe Global possible. Please visit us online at www.monroeglobal.com for more product, partnership, or to join us at one of our live events around the world.